Baptist Chapel. So now you can make your way up this way. We're going to give them time to sing a few songs for you, and I know it'll be a blessing. Uh, if our uh, speaker needs no introduction, and it's a brother, when they're done, uh, you come on back and forth so you can sing this Bless Our Heart song. We're thankful for these guys making the sacrifice to come over and be with us. I know it'll be a blessing. So you open up your heart and mind, and the Spirit's here, and you just mind the Lord. Great to be with you tonight. I'm Sam Harris, the Minister of Music there at Parker Chapel, and it is our honor to be here. This is Greg Whitehurst singing bass. His wife playing the piano is Brandy Whitehurst, and singing baritone is Dennis Jones. Singing lead is one of my best friends. Went to college with him. We've known each other forever, and we still enjoy singing uh, for the Lord, don't we? This is Stephen Stocks, and so glad to have him. And our bass player, Erwin Hines, we're glad you made it. His GPS lied to him tonight. Uh, so uh, we're glad that he could be here tonight, and so we're, we're excited to be here and to minister to you tonight. One of these days, when it's all said and done, we'll be touring that city. What a wonderful, wonderful time that'll be. It'll be great to see all of our family and friends, but the most important thing, we'll see the one who died for us, that will be Jesus. Looking forward to it. Oh, <laughs> 
that's pretty good right there. Uh, I do want to make mention of some, some people here that would be in service uh, from our church. Uh, we've got, I've actually got two deacons here with me tonight. And uh, one of their wives, one of my trustees, the Sunday school teacher, his wife. I've got uh, the gentleman who pastored the church ahead of me, Dr. Brendan Stocks. I've been a preacher in uh, spoken before a number of times. He's with me, so Stephen and then Cortez and uh, Nick, one of their wives as well. And so I, if we're getting the Bible tonight, I think I got the Bible. I'll be honest with you. We used to give a Bible out of a Bible that brought both people. I did all right tonight, I'll be honest with you. So I'm glad I can be here with you. Dr. Stocks leaned up to me a minute ago, and he said, are you sure you can handle this? And I said, handle what? He said, the service tonight, the preaching. He said, because if you can't, I got one with me just in case. And then uh, <laughs> Dennis Ray, wife, there's someone in the front row, Jody, looked at me, did not miss a beat. She said, by the way, if he can't handle it, I can. I got one in my Bible, too. So uh, maybe we branched out there at Parker's Chapel didn't realize it. It is good to have Brother Phil Aiken Johnson and Daddy here with us in service tonight. And uh, Brother Phil was the first pastor I worked with uh, when I went into the ministry. And I learned a lot of deep foundational truths that were available from a Baptist church. Uh, that's the tie-in with uh, me being Johnson's youth pastor for a time. And so I learned a lot from Brother Phil. Uh, he married, uh, as good as any of us can marry the ministry. Y'all know Johnson's mama. Uh, she could be married to Mother of Jesus for sure. And uh, Miss Kelly was a great couple. Great couple to be a Leslie to be with early on the ministry. And love our friendship that we have to today. I've got several ties to the Jesus family from Brother Phil, Jonathan, Joseph, Brother Nate. So, uh, Probably some of you were wondering last night if I was an age anyway, because uh, we got to feel right strong last night for a little while there, didn't we? But it was good, and you stayed right with me, and I, I appreciate that friendship with that family. Funny thing tonight, I will say this to you. I did not know that my mother-in-law is this. Miss Vicki, wave at everybody right quick. This is Leslie's mom right here. Obviously, that would make her my mother-in-law. And uh, my sister Tracy sitting there beside her, but uh, Tracy goes to our church as well. And so Leslie came. Uh, with us last night in service. Miss Vicky's here tonight. I guess the other daughter, Laura, Kathleen, will be here tomorrow night. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see with that. But it'd be good. Since my mother in law here is here, I'm going to change my message tonight because I know some stuff uh, she needs to have preached to her about right now. So, anyway, would you take your Bibles and go to the Gospel of Matthew? Last night while I was preaching, the Lord at the very end laid on my heart what he wanted me to preach tonight. Now, I love when he does that kind of stuff. Uh, the tough thing is when you go to do a, a revival somewhere or you're speaking at a conference and you've got three or four messages bouncing around in your heart and your mind, oh, Lord, which one do you really want to speak about? Here's the great thing. I have to completely trust God tonight to give me uh, what you need. Because Jonathan has not come and said, look, you need to preach on this, this, and this. He's not anything like that. We just had met with the Lord, had prayed, and let God lead and guide us. What was interesting, though, was I was thinking in the back of my mind, I just preached a message in uh, two chapels, one at Mount Calvary, one at Greenville Christian, the message God gave me this semester. And I've been really encouraged how God has used it. I thought, Lord, you know, I could go to that one, too. And I realized I still had that one in my Bible. So I think I may just preach both of them tonight if they're okay with that. Can we? Some of you are going, <laughs> whatever you do. Last night, we, we got to the end, and we really anchored in last night on the Word. If we're going to have revival, it's going to be because we're in the Word, and the Word is going to be in us. And at the very end, as I was preaching, I felt the Holy Spirit touch my heart and just take me into this area. So I, I want this to be a blessing to you. And by the way, if we read the Word and get into it tonight, it's going to be a blessing to us. Matthew chapter 6, I want you to look with me at verse 5, and, and we've got uh, another text here in a moment we're going to just ease right to it and serve on the mail. I'll give you a moment while you're turning. Matthew chapter 6, God has a sense of humor. I can promise you he does. Now, Scripture does not say a lot about God laughing or anything like that. He does think of having a merry heart. But if you look at the concoction that were the apostles, and you look at how they're wired with each other, okay? Matthew was the one, they kind of slid into the group that felt like it, okay? And I'm going to explain to you what Matthew must have felt like. Matthew felt like a Democrat at a Republican convention. Now, 
I'm not there. I don't know if you're a Republican Democrat or not. We're not going to talk about that so much. Matthew was a guy who had worked. He really had sold out his own people. Okay? Most of the guys were fishermen who were the apostles. Matthew was a ta- tax collector. He was a businessman. He is the last person you'd have thought that Christ would have called and said, come, come be an apostle with me. And there were two types of tax collectors, by the way. One tax collector, he would own the business, but he would hire somebody else kind of to work the front desk. So he kind of removed himself from it. But what you were doing is you were taxing the Jewish people. So as a Jew, you were seen as a traitor. You had sold out for commerce and capitalism your own people to make money. And there was another type of tax collector. He didn't really care what you thought. He was the one working the front desk himself. That's what Jesus said. Matthew was. Matthew was somebody. He was not ashamed of selling out his own people and making money. But you know what? It's amazing when Christ calls you and he converts you to change, he puts in you. And who had been the outcast at one point became a, a central figure of the apostles. There's another apostle named Simon Zelotes that was, he was all about overthrowing the Roman government and wrecking them from first persecution and all these things. I always wondered, how did Matthew and Simon get along with each other? That had to be a work of grace the whole time. So God commissions Matthew to write to the Jews. Y'all think about that. The one who had kind of sold them out now becomes a main minister to them. He writes to the Jews and lays out so many beautiful truths about the genealogy of Christ and how Christ is our Savior and our Lord and the Messiah and the Master and all these wonderful things. He even records the first public sermon of Jesus. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus has a large crowd that comes to him. And on one side, he has got some wicked, rebellious, unrighteous sinners. You know anybody like that tonight? By the way, we all have been at some point in time, haven't we? On the other end, so he's got the rebellious unsaved over here. Then on the other end, he's got the religious unsaved. Religion won't save. Okay? I had someone ask me recently, my newcomers class at church, raised their hand, said, I just want to ask you a quick, that's the key word, quick question. He said, what's the difference between being a Christian and a Roman Catholic? <laughs> so I just thought, take 13 seconds. Let's walk through it. And I, I, I begin to write down the board the differences. By the way, there are a lot of differences in the two, okay? So we're going through these things. In fact, my wife and I met today with a lady who has been raised in Eastern Orthodox religion from Europe, uh, Greek Orthodox, actually, and we walk through her, walk with her today through what is grace and what is faith. And she talked about, she said, oh, Pastor Gene, when I was a child, I remember my grandmother taking me to church, and, and I would lay, listen to this now, I would lay down on the floor, and the priest would step over me. This sounds like a pretty cool activity, that would okay? The youth pastor stepped over everybody, all right? I said, why did you do that for? She said, because for the priest to step over you, it was a sign of God blessing you. She said, I can remember being a little girl, and there was a church down the street open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's not pretty cool, I should say that. She said, I would run in there sometimes, and I would scribble a little prayer down and leave a $5 bill so the priest would pray for me. You can go talk to somebody before a bell all you want to, but the Bible says there is one mediator between God and man, and that is Christ Jesus our Lord. See, Jesus speaks to a group of people who had taken the truth and the purity of religion, and they had corrupted it. And so they were kind of on the side, somewhat smug, somewhat examining, somewhat judging the Lord. And listen, you had the rebellious and you had the religious, and they all, listen, they all need to be redeemed. They book in a greater group, but they they just say it. So Jesus is laying out this these truths about honest, sincere religion, not this dead stuff that the Pharisees had taken the word and twisted and corrupted, but a personal relationship with God. What does a real relationship with God look like? 
Well, I was praying coming up 264 tonight. I was just thinking of that. We'll visit 1 John 5 and, and closing tonight. But that whole book is about knowing for sure that you're saved. Brother Phil mentioned that earlier, praying. In fact, he and I and Landon had a little time to pray together a moment ago in the fellowship hall area. We, we were just for a moment rehearsing that. And I thought, man, I wonder if there's anybody here tonight. Man, they think they're saved, but they're not. To convince yourself. Listen, you don't have to convince your, yourself that you're saved. The Bible says that the Spirit of God will agree, he'll bear witness, he will have testimony with your spirit that you know the true and living God. See, Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship. But you know what I found out about Christians? We will take Jesus almost like a hymn book and we'll open him up on Sunday and we'll look at it then and we may sing there, but the rest of the week we just put it back in the pew. How's that working out for you? So Jesus takes this hungry, searching group of people and he brings them to some awesome principles of relationship found in some of the mouth with Matthew. Look at this with me, right? Because this is where God is going to anchor us at this evening. Matthew chapter 6. I want you to pick up with me, reading in verse 5. Now, church, help me with this a little bit. Not this Monday night. You've had a long day. You're tired. A lot been going on. I want you to stay engaged with me. So as I hesitate, I want you to fill in this word where I hesitate. The Bible says in verse 5 of Matthew 6, And when thou, what? Prayest. It is understood in a living relationship with God that his followers, his children, are going to want to talk with him. They're going to want to spend time with him. They're going to be around him, and he calls that prayer. He never says, well, if you are going to pray, he implies you're going to already be praying. Here we see the priority of prayer. He says, now, you shall not be as hypocrites are. The people who have different faces for different settings with different people. No, he teaches us the sincerity of prayer. He says, well, they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Certainly, verily, surely, I say unto you, they have their reward. They got what they were looking for. They received their answer. But you, when you pray, enter into thy closet. Here we see the sincerity of it and the simplicity of prayer. And when you have shut the door, pray to your Father which is in what? Secret. And your Father which seeth in secret shall reward you openly. But when you pray, use not empty words or vain repetitions as the heathens do. For they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you walk. Now I want you to turn to your Bible just a page over probably. Turn to Matthew 7, 7. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7. Jesus is preaching and he says, I need you to know, here's the priority of your relationship with God. We call it prayer. Well, everybody at that sermon knew about prayer. They were aware of prayer. They had heard prayers. They had probably spoken prayer. And then Jesus lays the axe to the root of the tree. He says, let me tell you first of all about prayer. You cannot be like the hypocrites. Notice how Jesus called out sin. He said, there's a group, they pray just to be seen of men. How would the Pharisees felt convicted? See, sometimes the Lord was throwing seed and sometimes he was throwing salt. Y'all were sitting in church. Brother Jonathan's preaching. One moment it feels like seed is going to do something in your life. The next one it feels like salt is kind of stinging and singeing you a little bit. Jesus said they're not heard because they look impressive and pray. Because they wow the crowd, that doesn't mean they've been heard by God the Father. And he moves them now and says, here's what you do. You get by yourself and you get alone with God and you pour your soul out and your Father would see it in private will honor you in public. He said, because your father knows what you have need of before you ever even begin to pray. Jesus gives us three aspects of prayer in Matthew 7 tonight in the life of a believer. Look at it with me. Verse 7, he says, 
pass. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Now that's not the end of the thought, we'll finish this in a few moments. But Jesus has given us earlier the priority of prayer, and now he moves to the practice of prayer. Now, growing up, I had an opportunity to play some sports in high school. By the way, how many of you played something in high school? Raise your hand. You played something, all right? I played football, I played basketball, I played baseball. One of my children asked me one time, is there anything you didn't do? I said, yep, I was not a cheerleader. Can I get an amen? Okay, all right. And for us in football, football season not too long ago ended. We practiced Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Whatever you, sometimes we would literally drag into church. On Friday, I mean, on Wednesday, I mean, you just didn't make it in time, and you know, you were sitting there, you got a bath, and that was about it, and you were there. We practiced every day, Monday through Thursday, 3 30 to 5 30. And football is a game, you got to want to play that game. You don't halfway want to play it. I mean, either you're in or you're out. There's not a lot of gray area in between. You got to earn that helmet, you got to earn that number. I used to have a coach who used to tell me all the time the number don't make the man, the man makes the number. A lot of neat truths playing sports. Monday through Thursday, we would do this thing called practice. And we would show up at practice and we would do our stretching and we would do our running. And our coach, our coach was a mean rascal. Our coach needed to know the Lord. He had this little evil invention. I don't know who created it. First of all, didn't love the Lord. He had this little thing he kept in his mouth right steady. He had a cord hanging off of around his little neck. And every day from 3.30 to 5.30, he enjoyed playing with this little thing. I thought he was OCD about it. It was called a whistle. And he would blow that whistle constantly. I mean, every time something went wrong, he was on that whistle. He was in our ear. He was saying this. By the way, he didn't even know my mama that way. What was he talking about? He blew that whistle practice. And he kept at it with it. From August to November, that dominated our afternoons. And the reason was because Friday night was coming. Friday night was going to soon be upon us. And at 7 o'clock on a Friday night in that metropolis of Chocolate in North Carolina, we were lined up, ready to roll. And I can remember back to weeks that we practiced really well and we knocked off some big teams. There were some weeks... We thought we had it won. We had, we're good. I mean, this, this is a nobody. In fact, we lost a chance to go to the playoffs by junior year because we had beaten this team before. We thought we had them, and, and we didn't. They had us. You know what I said about a number? They had our number. And we realized that to win, we must practice. Can I tell you one of the greatest failures in our lives as believers that we had? We failed to practice it. We look at prayer as something we do on Sundays. Or we look at prayer as something we do over a meal. Or we look at prayer as something that's kind of a 911. This is God, I'm in trouble, hurry up and get me out of that. Anybody ever pray that way? I'm going to ask y'all that again. Anybody ever pray that way, that 911 praying? Oh, you want to see some people praying? Go into a classroom of students who've not studied. Conviction's falling right here. Okay, right now. Oh, yeah, I, I was blessed to teach school for a few years of my life. I enjoyed that setting. But I can remember walking in class and kids going, you know, they got this look about them. The look says, I've done anything, but they're not prepared. But they're, they're going to go talk to Jesus about it. By the way, I know they did that because I did that. How many of y'all are going to go take a test and you didn't prepare for it? Raise your hand. Y'all start to, you and your young people right here, y'all know they did because you did you show up for something in class and you had to study, you start talking to the Lord. Oh, Heavenly Father. Oh, I'm next to Almighty God. You start creating words about it, okay? And you say something, Lord, if you will get me out of this one right now, Lord, I promise you, this is the type of test you take in. The only right answer you'll get is your name on the paper, okay? Lord, if you get me out of this, I will never... I'm glad God has blessed us with this. 
I'm glad God is gracious, even even when, when we're not in a good spiritual state. It is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. See, so often as Christians, we look at we look at prayer as optional. And we wonder why God doesn't do more in our life, in our homes, in our church. I got one time to say, he was in trade to trade there for a little while to say. And I don't think he was meaning it ugly, but sometimes people kind of, sometimes people will take the pastor and they'll hug you. But while they're hugging, they're kind of putting a knife in the back at the same time. And God's not pleased with that. He mentioned right there. Well, you know, we just ain't seeing the people say we used to see saved people. And about the fourth time he mentioned that, I finally went to him and said, let me just ask you a quick question real quick. He said, sure, I love him, good man. I said, when's the last time you witnessed to his wife? That's what he said. What you just heard. No. I said, do me a favor. I said, would you quit? Would you not? I said, quit. I said, would you mind not praying about how we don't see people saved anymore and you're not out there? You're not out witnessing anybody yourself. I said, because I can tell you the last person I shared Jesus with, I'm all about how about See, we as a church tonight, we want to see God do great things, and we want to do very few things. See, God do anything great. Here, when the Bible says, yes, it means that you're lacking something. You don't have something that you need. He says, ask. I wonder tonight here in this church, is there anybody lacking anything? The Bible says that you have not because you ask not. James says, and when you do ask, sometimes you ask off target, you ask amiss, and you wonder why God doesn't answer. So Matthew reports Jesus looking at this group of people and he said, okay, prayer must be a priority, and here must be, here's your practice. You must begin to ask. The author of Hebrews tells us that God invites us and he instructs us and he calls us to his throne of grace that we may come and ask when we're in a time of need. Tonight, if there is something in your life that you are lacking, God is going to call you, he's going to beckon you, and he's going to say, come and ask. I love that my children are asking for stuff. How many of y'all got children still asking for stuff? Raise your hand. Now, I'll tell you how children ask you for stuff. Sky is the limit. Children don't mind asking, do they? I mean, therefore, last night we were on our way home. We were trying to get home early and, and uh, a few minutes earlier, and Leslie had to teach today with school. And, and so we're rolling. I looked over. I said, hey, hey let's stop at McDonald's. It's a Farvel. Uh, in Farvel, there's McDonald's now. It's pretty cool. Route 264. Slide off. So some of y'all have eaten there. I know you have. Some of y'all will eat there tonight, by the way, okay? We slid off right quick. I heard my son about going, oh, what are we doing? What are we doing? And Grace said, we either going to Bunch Angles or we're going to McDonald's. We pulled off. I turned to McDonald's. Faith was like, we're going to McDonald's. I know where we're getting. We're getting ice cream. I said, we're going to get out. We're going to get a quick little snack on the way home. And Grace says, hey, Dad, hey, can I get double fudge on that? We haven't even heard anything just yet. And Grace is already in the, can I get some double fudge? Can I get an amen? What was it she was asking? I'm afraid we are guilty of not honestly coming to God and asking. Look at the next thing he says here. He says, seek. Seek is the idea of not just lacking. Seek is the idea that you're looking. You're looking for something. You're looking for God to do something, and you are seeking after. The Bible says that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. So there's sometimes in my life, in prayer, I'm revealing that I'm lacking something, but there are times now I'm also looking for some things. You look, and you're saying, God, when, when and how are you going to do this? See, he tells us that prayer must be a priority, and there must be a practice of it. But see here, the Lord also reminds us, in prayer there must be patience. Looking is the idea that you you started and you haven't stopped just yet. Now, let me just poll my people tonight because I love you and love being with you. How many of you tonight are kind of lacking in the area of patience? 
I didn't ask you to shout them up again. I had someone at church on recently, great job, I'm praying for Peggy Jane Moore. The Bible says New Testament, tribulation works out patience in our lives. By the way, we're not good at being patient, are we? And the idea of patience, biblically, is I learn to get off of my timetable, and now I get onto God's timetable. See, we go into asking, and we think sometimes it's either a black or white, yes or no, he said this, we're good, we're not. But there are times in prayer, God doesn't say anything. And we go to pray, and we know it's a practice, and we've got by ourselves in private, and we're praising, and we're asking, and it's just not happening. And that doesn't always mean that something is wrong. Sometimes that means you are dead center right on where God wants you to be. Because he's developing patience in your life. There are some areas that God says, I want to build some spiritual discipline and strength in. And I, you know, God is not a microwave God. He's a crockpot God. He didn't just show up and give it to you immediately. There's a process of him getting you ready. And that process is involved in patience and just to continue to see what God has for you in his life. There's a lot of blessings that are forfeited by God's people because we either don't exhibit patience or we don't exhibit here. That's for preparation. That is the sweat to go after a situation and say, okay, God, I'm going to keep looking. I'm going to keep searching until you answer this need in my life. See, someone who really wants to see something done by God, the first time you have a defeat or the first time you have a bump in the road, you won't do it. So it didn't work out like you hoped. That doesn't mean you should stop. That means you trust God and you continue to see. He says, okay, prayer must be a priority. Here's the practice. Here's patience. He says, ask. See. Look at the next thing he says. Knock. What do you knock on? You knock on a door. Something that's closed. See, he says you've been lacking, you've been looking, and now you're lost. Now there is something there that you feel like a wall has been put up in front of you. You just, for whatever reason, you can't quite seem to get through it. You say, Lord, what, what are you teaching me right here? But the knock, the knock, and that's being repetitive. Jesus shows us in prayer, not only do we have patience, but there must be persistence. See, listen to me now. The way the, the, way the words ask, seek, and knock are written in the original language, it means to ask and keep on asking. To seek and keep on seeking, and to knock and to keep on knocking. There's some area in our lives that we feel like is walled up and we can't get through, and the Bible says, You knock, you knock, and keep knocking, and you keep knocking, and you wait and see what God will do in your life. Listen to me, like church. God never says no to us that He doesn't give us a better use. Even when he says, wait on me, and be of a good courage, I'll strengthen your heart. There's all a process of him working in my life to bring me his best. Every so often, the oldest child, Faith, and she's been, she's already taking driver's day, she's been driven just yet. I'll give y'all a Facebook note when she does, let everybody know she's driving. She's always asking me at church, hey, can I, can I get the suburban? Can I get the truck? They can know. She's like, why well, won't you let me drive a church? I'm like, because there's people around and there's vehicles and I don't trust you just yet. Well, I know at some point in her life she's going to be ready to do that. Now's not the time. we got to show that patience with God, that persistence, because He's getting us ready. Jesus goes on to say from here, if I uh, you ask somebody for a fish, you think that would give you a snake? That'd be a little bit something, would it not? You wanna, you wanna ask for ready and stone? It's 
understand the fact that you, if you being sinful, know how to be good to your children, how much better you think your heavenly father will be? And because God is so good, and because God is so gracious, and because God is so giving, and prayer is a revelation that I want you to do for others like you'd have them do for you. I want you to reflect God in your day-to-day living, in your day-to-day giving, because you have a dependence upon God, and you trust Him, and He works and moves in your life. So you do good for others. as a reflection of me doing good for you. Brother Sam, my right hand man, sent me down one time in the office and we were talking about some areas. And I was very personal with him. I came in to meet with me. I said, Look, I got, I got this question about preaching. Just tell me this real quick. He said, And, and we're, we're, we're brothers from another mother with each other. But we're very, very close with each other. He said, Hey, can I, can I bounce this off of your thought for you? I said, Yeah. He said, Some of these messages you're preaching, he said, You'll get into it in a big way. And he's like, I almost wish you would slow down and stop. He said, because you get this point and you get these sub points and you're on to the next point. He said, you're at point two or three. In my mind, it's still chewing on one. He said, oh, then you've lost my attention. I'm just thinking, man, I wish you had slowed down here. He said, some of these messages you're preaching, he said, Gene, that, that could be a small series. That's right after one lady from church came to me and said, preacher, can I give you a thought? I said, sure, you can give me a thought. She said, I love steak. I love chicken. She said, I even love lobster. But I love it all at the same time. I said, what are you saying? She said, sometimes you load my liking so much. She said, I, I can't take it all in. I said, all right. So I, I begin to slow down some of my preaching. Funny thing happened. As I slowed down and kind of let the flock catch up, we started seeing God work in some areas of our church. See, I had been given a very good ministry from Dr. Stocks. He had been Moses, and I got out here to be Joshua. And so everything I'm doing is built up what he's done. But I was just, I mean, we were seeing God do some good things. We were growing some, and there were some people getting saved, some people getting right. And it seems like there just was not the inertia and the energy there that we had hoped for. Nothing was necessarily wrong. It just wasn't quite as right. Are y'all, y'all listening to me tonight? It's not that everything was wrong. It's just it wasn't quite as right as it needed to be. And so I began to slow down and preach, thus saith the Lord. And I watched God take his word and begin to feed the sheep and work on hearts. And I was preaching out of Hebrews and James about knowing for sure whether you were a true child of God and a believer. And on a Monday night, a guy walked into our church, came to meet with one of my associate pastors, I spoke to him, and he sat down with Brother Robert, who's my minister of education, and they began to talk, and I went on to the hospital, and as I was coming back from the hospital, he, he, he texted me and said, hey, can you come by my house? I said, yeah. I was a little odd. So I came on by the house, so I sat down in the living room with him. This, listen, this boy, been in, he's been at Parker's Chapel at that point 44 years of his life. He's been a Sunday school teacher. He's been a trustee. We would see him be up. We would see him be down. We would see him happy. We'd see him mad. We'd see him encouraged. We'd see him discouraged. At one point in our ministry, he had quit coming to church with us entirely. He just dropped out. Then he came on back and was always just back and forth. And man, you loved him and we liked him. But I'm telling you, he's one of these people as a sheep. He would wear out the shepherd. I know y'all have any of that here. So I sat out in this living room. He said, I want to tell you what's been wrong with me in the past. I said, Joy, what's been wrong with you? He said, You know, I got this out. I said, What you mean? He said, I played the all these years of my life. He said, You know, I've got insurance for my salvation four times. He said, there's a reason I have to keep getting insurance for my salvation to be this one son. He said, I've sung in the choir. I've been a trustee. I've taught Sunday school. He said, you see me struggling in sins too. He said, there was the Joey Braxton you saw in church, and then there was the Joey Braxton that my wife and two children saw at home. Joey said, I want you to know something. A few minutes ago in Brother Robert's office, I got real with God, and I got serious, and I asked Jesus Christ to 
saying that I was even though I was my pastor, I am now saying that I am a born again Christian. That's awesome. And by the way, he's never even looked like the same individual. Joy, before we were saved, Joy, after we saved, they just they just look get you as the church people. He just looked different. In the midst of this, of us asking and seeking and knocking, Jonathan was doing the biggest renovation we've ever done since I've been there. Let me tell you something. I know I got four pastors sitting in the room tonight and other staff members. When it's your name on that line, and you now have led the church as God's led you into a three hundred thousand dollar building project, I don't know. That just hits you a little differently, and you're thinking, Lord, now if you don't show up, we're going to be in a mess and find a new place to minister. And so I'm like, Lord, you've got to be doing something. And so we're going into our church's gym to have church for 12 weeks while they renovated our sanctuary and gave us more space. I remember that first Sunday morning, I was on my knees in the gym by myself at the risers saying, Dear God, I know you've led us into this. I trust you with this. But if you don't show up in this, if you don't help us with this, Lord, it's not going to go anywhere. It's got to be all you. It cannot be any of us. And Lord, listen to me, church. I was asking him, man, I was seeking him, and listen, I was knocking on that door. And I was all in. I was sold out. Lord, if you don't do it, it can't be done. Oh, that's an awesome place to be in your life. That Sunday morning, I preached out of Matthew 7 about not all those that said to me, Lord, Lord, show up in the kingdom of heaven. I got to the very end of that message, and I stopped. He said, I want y'all to hear a testimony. I said, well, good point. We don't normally do it that way. We normally do our testimonies when we get to the Sunday night. Joey Braxton came to the microphone, and he took off two minutes. He said, church, I want you to know I've been here for 44 years, and I have played the game my entire life. He said, I was one way at home, and I was one way at church. By the way, Jesus called that being an free. And he said, I want you to know this week that Brother Robert's school was off, and God got a hold of me, and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And I just want y'all to pray for me, and I want you to know this morning that I am now saved. And I said, everything about it, God works. What proceeded to happen from there was a God thing. Our church had a 56-minute invitation. Sam sung every verse of Just As I Am. I think he created a few while he was there on earth. We had him stand. We had him sit. We had him stand. We had him sit. We had him stand again. We sang songs and hymns that weren't even invitation songs. This is how the Lord was moving. That Sunday morning, we had over 60 people come to the altar that Sunday morning. That Sunday morning, we had 14 people in our church get saved. I mean, get really say, I mean, genuinely sold out surrender at the altar, begging and crying, confessing sin, snotting, slobbering salvation. I mean, the old school version. We had 20 people rededicate their lives that Sunday morning. It was, I mean, it was just like you were there. And God was moving and God was working. And every week we were in that gym, we had somebody get saved. We had over 60 people in our church get saved during that time frame. We had 80 people rededicate their lives. And see, while God was allowing a physical renovation of our church to be done, he was giving us a spiritual renovation. By the way, that residue will rest on us right now. We kept and baptized, and now a majority of those people are members of our church. And it all went back to a time. group of men who knew it was not in them, got on their knees and their face before God, we asked, we saw, we know. If Wildwood Fiddle Baptist Church is going to have this type of revival, it's going to be that you make prayer a priority. You make prayer a priority because God is your priority. This church is going to make God a priority in a fresh way. You're going to see that in prayer. Y'all are going to see a change in your practice in praying. You're going to see a patience and a persistence developed. 
And what you're going to start doing, listen to me, we're all but done. You're not going to just wait because there's something wrong to come to an altar. Listen, you're going to come to the altar sometime because there's not anything wrong. And you're not going to have to have God stand up on the top of a pew and scream your name and say, don't you come to the altar. You're going to come to a place, if you hear him just whisper into your spirit, you're leaving where you are, and you're getting down here, and you're getting with God, and you're going to start asking and keep asking. You're going to start seeking and keep seeking. You're going to start knocking, and you're going to keep knocking. And you're going to go that over and over and over, and you will see God work and move and minister in a way that you never even imagined. That's how God works. That's not a religion. It's a relationship. Let me tell you where we are, God. We're going to pray right now. I will promise you that everybody in this sanctuary has something or someone to know. You need to pray about it. And you need to come down and get right here with you and ask. Say, God, I'm coming right here. God, I'm looking. God, I'm all. He's right here. Right now. He can come to you. Let's pray, Father. Get into humble hearts tonight. 